You are trying to take away the right of some people, right, Benipa? Yes. You're trying to take away the rights of the parents of the children, of the children themselves, and then of their right. medical team. Okay. Yeah. Because although I was taught that there were like good and bad slave owners, I, d I just thought of the South growing up from my childhood as like, oh, they were the, they were the bad guys. When he, learning other stuff, I'm like, oh, okay, that was their, they had a, they had an actual side that you could understand. Somebody says, slavery is a horrible institution, we should rightfully condemn it in the United States. And then somebody counters that with, well, some slave owners were pretty nice. Then even if that's a defense of an individual or some group of people, it almost comes off as a defense of the institution. Is transphobia and racism real? And the same question goes for y'all as well. I say no. I don't think that they should be allowed in the sports because it's, it's promoting visibility, right? <laughs> Yeah, visibility, it plants something in the in young people's minds, say, that, hey, this is a possibility, and then Satan can whisper in their ear, you, you are this, and you want to be like this. So I don't, it's part of that promoting wrong is right type of, should, wrong is, not necessarily right, but wrong is fine. Should thing. atheists be allowed in sports? <laughs> as long as they keep their mouth shut. We'll start the first question in particular, whether or not trans women should be in women's prisons was one of the questions that was submitted. And so thanks so much to the panelists. The floor is all yours. Let me specify, it's not on whether or not trans women should be in women's prisons, but more so trans women who had broken the law, whether or not they should be in women's prisons. <laughs> The main topic is critical race theory, correct? That was the starting theory. So, so we're, we're just answering that question right now. That, we're asking whether or not trans women should be in the same prison systems as cis women? Exactly. The reason why we have them separated out is usually safety reasons, um, why men and women don't occupy the same spaces in prison. So I, as weird as it sounds, we could probably use Olympic standards or something to determine whether or not a trans woman should be in a in a cisgender women prison or with cis men, I guess, maybe. Um, so like if you've been on hormones for one year or two years or something, then maybe you should be able to, or if you're in the process of transitioning, maybe you should be able to. Um, I mean, it's maybe some answer like that would be my guess. But the problem you'd have to face on the other side, though, is that if you put somebody that's just beginning a transition into a cisgender prison, that person probably, uh, actually, I know they do. It's like 13 times higher uh, risk of facing some sort of violent action in prison as opposed to a cisgender person. So I mean, you have to face that as well. I would probably be okay with those types of standards. I think that the biggest fear that we are dealing with when we talk about these issues is whether biological women are going to be put into harm's way. I think we should at least address that. I think that going under hormone therapy, transitionary surgery, and making sure that you have an accurate notation from a therapist, I believe, goes a long way in alleviating a lot of those fears for both biological and trans women. I would go with, we should do whatever is required for the safety of each inmates, which if that includes having different sexes or different weight classes of prison things, like that's, that's fine. I mean, whatever benefits the most safety, I haven't looked at all into the evidence of what would benefit the most safety, but whatever should, more safety, good. Um, I think that prisons should be boring and not dangerous in the sense that you have, you're at risk, that anybody is at risk from assault or, or whatever. So um, maybe we should bring back some of like the asylum type prisons and maybe that would be the solution. I don't know. You got another question that was submitted was whether or not, or I should say what age, trans children would be able to use hormone therapy? That is another hard question. We are dealing with people who can't consent themselves. And so you need to follow the guidance of both your child on one hand, and then the doctors and the people who have know what they're doing on the other. We are dealing with a feelings-based issue, which tends to be very subjective. And so when your child is coming to you and complaining and crying, I assume it breaks your heart. And so without jumping into anything, without 
pushing anything on the children, which I know is also another fear. I believe that you could take them to a viable therapist that will eliminate if there are any other problems along the way. And then I also think there is a sliding scale of how much you should actually do. So we shouldn't be putting children on hormones because children don't produce hormones. And so you want to actively look at how a puberty would go and try to mirror those effects. Um, I think for when it comes to children's medical decisions, I think it should be left to the doctors and the parents and ideally the children as well. Um, the idea that we would place some state restriction on some types of health care for children when children should have access to all the health care they need, I think is pretty silly. Uh, I, I think it should be th that should be a decision left to whatever team of counselors or psychologists are working with the child and the parents. And I don't think there needs to be a state intervention there to determine that there needs to be some minimum age um, before somebody can access some sort of medical treatment. Uh, from my understanding on the topic, of the people who do transition, a very small percent regret the transition, but of the people who feel dysphoric and in some way desire a transition, a very large percent have a remission rate of that desire when measured as kids. So it seems like, based on the science, well, there is probably some age at which we should wait uh, until they reach this age before we actually allow them to have a permanent surgery transition because there is such a high percent of people who initially want that who in inevitably change their mind. Um, but at the same time, because the surgery is so expensive right now, it seems like of the people who do transition, very, a very small percent of them regret it. Um, so it's, it's a hard, hard thing to assess, but I'd leave it up to the scientists and I'd say, yeah, we probably should establish an age. I'd probably go with age of consent, 16 or something around there, just as a easy baseline until we have harder science on the topic. Um, I, first of all, I take issue with the notion that it's hormone therapy because therapy is, has connotations of helping people. I think it's more like hormone shenanigans. And I think that definitely the, the father frequently is left out or forced out of these decisions. And the father is being called frequently like harmful to the kid. When I think the, the other way, the opposite is happening. The harm to the kid is pushed by the mother or whoever, the doctors, this, the, uh, <clears throat> the people at schools with an agenda. So, and I see even in the media, like I saw this headline from Yahoo News, transgender children who start hormone treatment during adolescence experience better mental health than those who wait until adulthood, according to some study. So it makes me just leery that we are that people are deferring more and more to scientists or so-called scientists and psychologists and all that stuff when at one point we ref we deferred to men fathers uh god um pastors who I, in a, in, a, in a way they've lost their authority because people are so weakened today but i don't think that it should be certain i just don't think that it should be before 18 but definitely the fathers need to be involved. I just want to talk about this notion of it being pushed, because I think it, it is a fear that I think can be alleviated with conversation, because I think there is a narrative out there that it is the, it is the liberal mom trying to push the, the gender theory onto their child. I have found the complete opposite. I, I understand that experience is uh, anything else but hearsay, uh, but in my own experience, I have found that it's coming out to both the parents. Sometimes, um, especially as a male to female, I think it's hard to come out to the father figure because you are leaving the male gender, and yet I, I think we can include the dad. We can uh, make sure that they are following the right procedures and making sure the child comes out as a healthy, functioning adult. You're saying that you've seen fathers pushing it on the kids or no, going I, along with the kids more I have than the mothers? seen almost universally that it is the child being, or whoever is transitioning, very hesitant. They're not well, excited. Hesitant to talk to the father. Yeah, not like, hey, mom and dad, I'm transgender. 
it generally, you know, it is a situation that you need to talk out that a lot of times I feel that a parent may be feeling like they're losing a child and so you need to have those conversations. But I feel like I came the other way around to the point that I now have a better uh, relationship with my parents than before. Question for Hake. Um, yeah. If it was proven beyond just the bias of the scientists, but in reality that they did lead healthier lives, if they did transition, would you be for that? I, I still don't think I would, honestly. Um, because I think that there are other ways, because what we're addressing is like mental health of the person, right? So-called, so even I take issue with the term mental health, really. But I don't think that I would be for that because it seems like a false solution to a symptom rather than the root issue, if that makes sense. Like the root issue, you deal with it. A lot of people get twisted in all kinds of different ways. We all have our issues. And uh, many times we just don't overcome them. But um, to prop this up as something right that we should go along with when honestly it just feels like insanity, you know? We, Question about that. Um, yeah. When you say the real issue, isn't the root issue quality of life? And so if they have a lower quality of life, whatever helps them to have a benefit of quality of life is solving the root issue, regardless of whether or not that ties into some kind of biology or not. Like, even if it's completely not connected to biology in any way, like say they wanted to install a horn on their head or something, mm -hmm. if that improves their quality of life, isn't that solving the root issue? I don't say so because that's like a like the horn on the head it's a it's like a silly solution like we need to the, the solution is to be like at peace with reality you know where we have uh we all have our issues and we need to overcome them or just keep them within and just be quiet stay in the closet if you will with our issues and have have a um have some shame and dignity show respect for others by hiding your issues. That seems really immoral to me because it seems like you're saying that people should be enslaved to reality in the way that reality has forced whatever on them, like if they're paraplegic or whatever, instead of using technology to overcome reality to better fit people's mental state. So to me, it seems like the moral thing to do would be to, to change biology reality in whatever way we can in order to make it more comfortable for people like we do with all technology. Why would we defer to biology or reality and how is that not just an appeal to nature fallacy? Well the paraplegic thing is it's like a totally different issue clearly like because that's that's not a state of mind or a state of uh, the soul or whatever. Well isn't that it's affecting the state of mind so the reason they it would... It does affect them. Yeah. Well no. the reason they would not want to be paraplegic is because they'd be happier if they wouldn't so isn't it giving them the ability to not be paraplegic how is that any different from somebody giving them the ability to feel more comfortable with themselves by adding a horn or any other surgery. But more important too, like you, you, what I know that you know is like your state of mind is very powerful in changing your uh, sense, of, sense of well-being even in a rough situation. Like we can look at somebody who's paraplegic and they can be happy and fulfilled and then we're feeling sorry for them but they're not mentally going through what we're, what we're going through in looking at them. For so, some, but others not right. so much. But that's that's what I mean is like that's those are some of the ways like healing the, the mind and the soul is much more important than addressing the physical things that can give you that can give you some make your life nicer. But shouldn't that be up to them? Able. Like cause some people may want to find solace in their internal strife like monks did. They gain from the suffering, but some other people be like, no, I'd rather walk. Shouldn't they have the freedom to choose that? Isn't that the moral thing to do to give them that option? Yeah, I'm not going to impose on somebody who's an adult wanting to do this, but I do question the doctors who are doing this with, with the transgenders. I mean, we're supposed to do no harm, but yet they're, they've, they're justifying through these different studies that, oh, this is not doing harm but I think that it is. Well, that's my question is if it improves their well-being, that seems to be the opposite of doing harm. But I don't believe that that's <clears throat> well-being really because that's a um, that's propping up making them feel better for being wrong, if that makes sense. 
Don't you think it's kind of like somebody basically has to be bought into your religious outlook, otherwise they're going to totally disagree with you? Isn't that a problem? But honestly, this is, it's not just a religious outlook. It's also like a commonsensical outlook. Okay, so common sense, if yeah. we're having a disagreement of common sense, then we need to appeal to something besides our common sense, right? I suppose so. So if I'm not a religious person and I don't think that there is some fundamental good of the Father or Christ or God or whatever, yeah. if you see somebody that is in distress, right? Like I don't think T-Jump is immoral because he wears glasses, right? To make an adaptation to his body to better fit, you know, like the world we have. Right. So could you not argue similarly for trans people that feel like their brain is miswired in some way? It seems like it's really hard to move the brain over to the body. Like we haven't been able to do that in therapy yet. And I believe a lot of people would like that. I think most trans people people would like it if they could just make their brain match their body and not have to worry about that, right? Yeah. So if it is the case that the only way to improve their outcomes, which is what therapy is, therapy is something where you have a treatment that improves the outcomes relative to the risk of the treatment. So if we do have something that we can use, like either surgeries or hormones, wouldn't it be good to have people have the option to pursue those? I'm not standing in the way of them doing it. If you, I just question the wisdom and the, and the decency of the doctors and the people who are purporting to be on their side when in reality I think that they're wolves in sheep's clothing like even if they don't even if even if they're not aware of it because they are um, They're thinking that they're helping but in reality this a lot of this stuff is not actually helping Can I ask do you believe? that They are the psychiatrists and the medical health doctors in mass are conspiring to push this as the I don't think it's a conspiring because conspiracy means secretive when in reality they're just openly for it. I think that, that they are, that people in general, all people are deluded. We all have to overcome our delusions or don't, most of the time we, we never overcome them. And so I think that we have a culture where this is pushed. And so like in a lot of ways there's pressure from their fellows it's kind of like the, um, the emperor who had no clothes. Everybody was afraid to say the emperor has no clothes except for the little child. So it's kind of that, I feel like it's somewhat that situation. What is your standard for assessing what health is? Because to me it's mental well-being, happiness. You're saying that if, even though it may give them greater mental well-being and happiness, mm -hmm. it's not I think there's another health. way. What, what is, is, what is the other way? I don't know, but <laughs> but the same thing that we all have to go through. We all have to. Um, we we all have issues that we just can't overcome, and we have to deal with them, mitigate them, hide them, stuff like that. But do you think that all forms of mental health are like fake diseases? So like ADHD is fake, and schizophrenia is fake, and all that. do you think that Not none of these are real? That all of these can be overcome without any sort of like therapeutic assistance? Not necessarily. Okay. But it sounds like you're saying you just need to take the burden. I mean, shouldn't we be trying to figure out how we overcome? So an example I will give is that the diagnosis is gender dysphoria. And right. yet in transitioning, in being able to do all this, I've become comfortable with my body. I've actually lost my gender dysphoria. I actually feel comfy. I just love living life now. And so <laughs> isn't that the, the best result? Isn't that what we're looking for in everyone? I don't know if. I don't know if it is because um, we all have like anger and evil within that we have to overcome still. Like I'm sure you have still dealing with some sometimes anger or some type of, sure. of issue that you still have to overcome. And I think that those, maybe those are the root. I just, yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's, I think that the root of anger and sin and evil can come can crop up in all sorts of different symptoms. It sounds like what you're saying though is that you maybe pushed it down or the problem's not over or the problems never end. I mean, I would agree with you that I still deal with hardships and heartbreak and all of the things that we sorrow over and I you get angry and you do things that you regret and apologize for, but I think that's just part of the human experience. I think that uh, to use a religious term, I think it transcends the biological and transgender. What transcends the biological and transgender? Trying to become a functional member of society, which right. I think right. is what transitioning does. I think it has given me a method 
I, I, we're all depressed as teenagers, but this was dark hole of start moment, soul moment. Um, and after you reach that, you start to dig up. And it has been only up since there. Not saying that it's not like a, you know, up and down, but I would say the trend, I've never been more happy to be part of Western society than right now. I guess I couldn't have been because uh, I wasn't alive, but I am very thankful that I was given the chance to make my inside match my outside. And now I can just do whatever I want. I'm not, I mean, I'm not taking the, the right to, to, to try to, like, I think we're all groping around in the darkness trying to find solutions to our inner issues. I'm not taking that away from you. I'm just saying that I don't think that it's right. And I do question the people who are, who are pushing this as something that we should be promoting and pr proud about and stuff like that. But you would have it be illegal for children. I, yeah, I would. So then you are trying to take away the right of some people, right? Benipa? Yes. You're trying to take away the rights of the parents of the children, of the children themselves, and then of their right. medical team. Okay. Yeah. I think I would be for all of that, what you just said. Okay. Yeah. We'll jump into the next, next broad, broad topic for the panel, in, in particular CRT, and, and the first question being whether or not it should be taught in public schools. schools. I think that the CRT thing is like a, I think it's just a big red herring for whatever people want to argue about. Um, critical race theory proper is not really taught outside of college. Um, we can argue whether like ideas that are downstream from CRT have kind of permeated some forms of curriculum. And I think that it's valid to have those conversations. But rather than having good conversations about what extent do we teach, um, you know, the liability that we should have for things we've done in the past, it becomes this weird dick waving contest where I guess some people on the left want to say like white people are evil and they should be kissing the boots of black people. And then people on the right are saying, well, actually, you know, the slaves were lucky to be here. We didn't know wrong. Like, you know, Indians were savages. Fuck all that. Um, I, I don't know. I, the whole CRT debate is like a brain rot debate where everybody can just kind of like smuggle in whatever issue they want to talk about. And it seems like that's what that whole conversation has become. I partially agree with what Destiny said. I think that CRT, the debate about CRT has boiled down to more consequences of CRT rather than CRT itself. I think that really the fundamental issues are that critical race theory employs faulty epistemology that entails certain fallacious arguments like standpoint epistemology is a fundamental tenet of CRT in the promotional books, which is the idea that we should allow the, the victims of essentially racism and other categories to define what racism is, which is like putting the defendant onto the, the jury. It's clearly counterproductive. It's just an anecdotal fallacy. So in order to, if we adopted or promoted this kind of an ideology, it would give a heavy bias to this kind of fallacious reasoning, which is scientifically inaccurate. We've proven this is a bad way to do thinking. Um, secondly, most of the policies that CRT promotes are policies which have been promoted by other non-inherently fallacious ideologies, and so you can still promote these things like teaching classes about um, the bad crap in American history. There's lots of places that do that. It's just mostly the Texas Board of Education that doesn't want that, which seems racist. But there are other ways to go about this other than adopting these lived experience storytelling, counter storytelling methodologies that are inherently fallacious. I think that Critical race theory has become a buzzword and a focus. They have wanted to try and go after something, and I think that the fear, once again, is going after children. And so you, I, I don't think that this is often taught in school. I will say that critical race theory is trying to just, trying to sess out if there was different damage to different groups, I'm, and trying to figure out their word is intersectionality between them. I would like to put an addendum that I am critical of the theory of race. And so I am skeptical of teaching anyone in the K through 12 system about I don't want to separate people. I think we should teach them the general history, the, the 
real history because we have uh, the United States has done both uh, horrific and amazing things, and it can't be one or the other. And so we need to be able to have good conversations between what they uh, all citizens, so that we can continue to enjoy a pluralistic society. And if there are people who are disenfranchised, it doesn't matter who they are. We should go and try to help them. Um, I think that this whole notion of social justice, there is no such thing as social justice in practice. Like this, like when they add this stuff, it means not real justice. They tend to reverse things and overcompensate for perceived past wrongs. Um, when I was growing up, we, were, we learned that there were decent and harsh, good and bad slave owners. And we learned both things. And we weren't taught that America was all perfect and everything. But now, I don't think that, I do agree that the critical race theory is something that's latched on to by people who don't really have the parents and the children's best interests at heart. A lot of rhinos will jump on board with this, and they'll just, I've, I barely heard of this thing like this last year. But I do believe that the notion of racism has been pushed in schools and in culture for decades, really. And it's like whites are the only ones primarily who've been accused of this racism thing when in reality everybody's, everybody acts in this way that they call racist. And it's, it, most of the time it's not a big deal. It's not anything that they're, they should be punishing. Um, I think that we should be maybe teaching this notion, this false notion, and, and also teach the truth. We should teach about communism and anti-communism in America so that the children are not seduced by it, by people who are, who are li a lot liars. We have like young women who are fresh out of college teaching anti-racism and Black Lives Matter nonsense to young kids, and that's, that's a mistake. If there's not any disagreement, we've actually burned through the prepared questions or the submitted questions, so this might be a good chance for an exploratory discussion. I don't want to throw questions or topics, especially at you guys, that you hadn't been told would be on here. So it might be a chance to ask each other questions in terms of things you might have comments about regarding other talks that they've given in the past, things that you might object to, whatever it might be. Uh, I have one specifically on this topic. Uh, Destiny, what's your view on critical race theory? Uh, I forget what the term you use, the real thing, not the strong. So I think that it's important when we look through, when we, when we look through theories, um, especially when it comes to theories like critical theory, critical race theory, um, or like critical legal theory, I think it's important to understand that these things are just like tools that we can use through which to view society. And when treated in that manner, I, I'm generally OK with most of the, uh, from what I'm aware of, most of the things that are being pushed by, I say being pushed by, some of the piranhas of critical race theory. So something that you brought up um, was some people have a problem uh, epistemically with this idea of a storyteller um, being like the focus point of some critical race theory. I can understand why people might be upset about that, and I think that when it comes to drawing broad trends sociologically, it's good to look at like numbers and data. But I think it's important to understand that when we talk about sociology, ultimately at the end of the day, we're, we're analyzing the individual and how they act in large groups. So I think it's good that we have a lens through which, if we're going to say broadly speaking, this is the story of um, an average American, an average working class person, an average middle class person, an average black person, we should be able to have a tool through which we can um, I'm sorry, analyze qualitatively individual stories of these people as well. And there should be some uh, like congruence at the end of the day between these two things. So to come back, I would never say like, oh, CRT is the one way that we should view society through, but rather maybe it's another lens that we can employ to gain some greater understanding of why some data is the way that it is, basically. From a weighting standpoint, do you think that the weight of the storytelling should be greater than or equal to the actual data? Because from my 
perspective, my understanding of CRT, the standpoint of epistemology overly weights the storytelling and then uses that to overrule the statistical data in many cases. Do you think that that's an appropriate way to do science? As long as CRT is one science, maybe, maybe not, but as long as that's just one tool that you're using to analyze something, I think it's okay to overweight the stories there in relationship to the data. Um, I, again, I, like I'm a data guy, I'm a pretty cold guy when it comes to analyzing situations, but most people don't work that way. And I think it's possible sometimes that you can miss, um, you can miss what's going on sometimes if you only look at the data. Like numbers might tell a certain story, but maybe when you start getting down to the unit of the individual, maybe we start getting a different story. If you're having an issue where when you're looking um, qualitatively at individual stories and none of them seem to be lining up, or a lot a lot of them seem to be contradicting the data. Maybe that can be a good reference point by which to go back and choose different data to analyze, potentially. So then um, would it be valid, too, to also, if this were, I don't think that you're necessarily advocating that it be taught or not taught in schools, but then would you be fine with like the, um, the Southerners' story on like the Civil War and leading up to it and afterwards? Because they have a totally, a, a, quite different narrative to what the Civil War was about and all of that stuff. If the narrative is real, sure. Um, I, I think that it's good to teach different perspectives. I think that having different perspectives is important. I think that a lot of people on the right have a really difficult time understanding the perspective of people on the left. But I think a lot of people on the left also have a really big deal or a, a lot of trouble understanding uh, the perspectives of the right. Because you'll get into these arguments where like, if you're opposed to CRT, it's because you're a racist, fasc fascist, hateful, anti-everything person. It's like, well, that's not always the case either. So I think there is value in both ends of that, sure. Yeah, because although I was taught that there were like good and bad slave owners, I, d I just thought of the South growing up from my childhood as like, oh, they were the, they were the bad guys. When he, learning other stuff, I'm like, oh, okay, that was their, they had a, they had an actual side that you could understand. Sure, I mean, you can have good and bad slave owners, it's possible, but like the institution as a whole is probably but that's, bad. Yeah that's, yeah. yeah, that's not my point so much, it's just what their, what their, their side of the story was. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. There's going to yeah. be like, there's going to be better like slave shop owners than other like for child labor. Some are going to be better than others, but the institution of child labor is still probably not a good one, right? Right. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'd have no. But issue I, so with I think that. the issue sometimes you run into is when these arguments are brought out, it might make people question the motivation for why the argument is brought out. So if somebody says slavery is a horrible institution, we should rightfully condemn it in the United States, and then somebody counters that with, well, some slave owners were pretty nice, then even if that's a defense of an individual or some group of people, it almost comes off as a defense of the institution. So I think you have to be really careful when you navigate those conversations. My only, my only point is not so much about this, what the good and bad slave owners. My point is, um, although I was taught that, I didn't know what their complaint against the North was. I was just taught they wanted slavery and they were racist. I didn't know why they were racist or whatever, if you will. Okay. But can I ask, can you, what was the example of a good slave owner that you were given? Um, they didn't really specify, but I did, I do know that like, I think Thomas Jefferson, Robert E. Lee, um, Robert E. Lee, for example, he, he said that um, slavery is a political and moral evil, but he would, he inherited this thing from his father-in-law. But I think. they're there. No, yeah, he had his. He inherited this thing from his father-in-law, right? He inherited this plantation, and it was doing rough. And so, what are you supposed to do? But you have to like, have keep these slaves on. I think eventually he wanted to get rid of them, but he he wanted to keep these slaves on in order to save the um, the property that he inherited from his father-in-law, because otherwise it would have gone underwater, and then the slaves would have been even worse off, possibly. Who knows? Or free. I don't know if he would just free them because you have to make some money off of, I don't know, it's a mess. <laughs> I had another question for Destiny. He mentioned that you said this would be okay as an epistemology to assess things. Now, I've, other than standpoint epistemology, the lived experience, storytelling, counter storytelling, naming one's reality, and the structural determinism are all very problematic when I look at this. Um, just accepting anything someone proposes as a alternative methodology to assess things and then calling it okay doesn't seem right to me unless there's some kind of evidential basis that it can actually accomplish something or has some kind of 
way to say that this is useful in some way rather than just saying, well, they're telling a story and we're going to accept it. Why would this be an acceptable methodology? Is there any evidence that you've seen that this actually works to accomplish anything or give us other insights into reality more accurately than data or other scientific methods that don't have these fallacies? Um, it's so. I think that some stories can be better than others, uh, or some might be more relevant than others. Um, all I would use this for is that like, I would imagine that this is something that's going to tag alongside more heavily uh, data-driven uh, empirical methods. But that I if we hear like certain stories over and over and over again, maybe that's cause for it. It's very hard to just like get a piece of data to capture everything of like the human mind. Um, like every human is an individual person. All of us experience things sometimes in similar ways, sometimes in different ways. So I think it's really hard sometimes to just give people facts and say, well, this is the story. This is what it is. I think sometimes looking at like the, the actual individual as a unit of analysis and then going by those stories, I think that there is some value there. Now, I would never come out and say something like, um, 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 I can't even think of an example where, where there's like some heavily data driven thing like uh, heart surgeries are successful 98% of the time and you get like the one or two percent where they're not successful and they're like oh well actually I think heart, uh, heart surgery sucks because my grandpa died from it it's like well that's an important story that should overrule the data um, but rather like I think sometimes we get stories that don't always line up with the data and I think sometimes those stories are pretty important um, because they can give us maybe something else to look at I think a really good example today um, or maybe all of all time would be economic situations right like the the way that the individual American sometimes feels about the economy doesn't map on neatly to unemployment. It won't map on neatly to um, inflation all the time. It won't map on neatly to median wages. Um, sometimes it might map on to like who's president. Sometimes it might map on to like uh, what did Chris Tucker or Sean Hannity say yesterday night about that, right? Or maybe it'll map onto only gas prices. So I think that there's sometimes there's value where um, people present data as being such, such an easy way to tell a story. It's very easy to look at data, but it's very hard to select which data to look at. So I, I think that there's some value in storytelling there and that like we can, you, you know, when you get like a full narrative from somebody, maybe it'll give you a different point of reference to start investigating from. Well, from what you just said, that would be an argument against critical race theory, that the people's feelings on the topic don't map onto the reality of how the economy is actually functioning, and so we shouldn't trust their judgment on this. But can you give any examples where critical race theory can give us a greater insight or has ever given us a greater insight other than the classical methods of science without critical race theory? So, um, fuck, my history is so bad. My understanding is that critical race theory, um, critical race theory, I think, sprung out when people were trying to use a critical legal theory lens to understand what changed in America that made it so that, um, I think it was so that we desegregated schools I think, is, I think is when it started, because um, legislatively and legally, I don't think anything had actually changed in the United States, but it was, um, I don't know if it was Plessy v. Ferguson or another case, but something came up before the Supreme Court or Brown v. Board of Education, um, where all of a sudden we got a dramatically different ruling out of the Supreme Court, but there wasn't really like a, a legal foundation or basis or precedent for why that happened, is my understanding. And when you try to analyze it through like the critical theory, critical legal theory, people kind of didn't understand it as much. And I think this was one of the big uh, motivations for starting critical race theory. We're like, okay, well, let's try to take a different lens to look at it. Let's look at the culture of the US at the time. Let's look at race relations at the time. And then through that lens, there was a better understanding of like, okay, well, with all these different pressures, we can see why the Supreme Court, maybe not from a strictly legal point of view, but from like a cultural racial point of view, might have made a different decision. So that would be an example, I think, of where the prior critical theory failed to give a good analysis of something, but through like a critical race theory, they felt like they had a better understanding of something, is my understanding of where, it's, where it started from. Oh yeah, that's totally right, but we got to the same conclusion, rather than, rather than using critical theory or critical race theory, we can just use basic philosophy and understanding of ethics and moral progress, and analyzing these same things in social progress from a standpoint of a much more rigorous epistemology, it seems like we get to the same answer or a better answer in the same topic, so why would we ever trust this kind of epistemology specifically? I think we're, we had another debate recently where we're going to go back to the same uh, foundation of our argument. I would probably agree with you on most of these things, like one-on-one, -on -one, but the problem is when you get into other people, they're going to have disagreements on like what moral progress is or what these things are. So um, again, I think that when you graph data and look at it, it's very easy to find like, well, this is a trend or this is a trend, but the argument is going to be over, well, what points are we graphing? How do we measure these particular things? And I think that's where people are pointing towards narratives more to see if there's other things that can be measured, essentially, is, is what I would imagine people would say.
with that, we can, if people, well, I do want to say, if you oh. have any, like I mentioned. I can add on one quick thing to that. I'm sorry. This is something I remember in my psych class. Um, I learned this in high school, so it may or may not be true. But I remember that um, so sometimes for psych experiments, it's good to do debriefs or talk to people at the end to see why they did things, because sometimes it's hard to understand. Um, I, I want to say a long time ago, there was an understanding that um, like the amount of sleep that you got was like very, very, very big into playing how successful you were in school. Um, and when they actually did interviews with children or whatever related to like how tired do you feel, blah, 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 um, even though the data like very, very cleanly lined up with more sleep meant more success in school, and so we want to say there's like a causal link there, and we can even explain biologically why sleeping is good. When it, when it came down to like interviewing individual students, um, the, the interviews didn't line up. Some thought that it wasn't a big deal, some didn't care how much sleep they got, sometimes they, you know, it, it was hard to figure out. And then for the outliers, um, for the, some kids that didn't get much sleep at all, and some kids that got way too much sleep, they, they didn't feel like the sleep was helping or not helping at all and that was interesting but one thing that kept popping up again was a really dumb confound that they should have found was well a lot of the kids that were sleeping well were just from wealthier families and one of the big things is that there were like parents in the household that were making sure that they were sleeping but not only sleeping but things like doing schoolwork attending extracurriculars etc and that when they started to look at like the family structure more and the support they were getting in the household that became you could fit a way cleaner line to that than you could by just looking at the sleep thing so that might be an example of where going down to the unit of the individual and getting people to tell stories that doesn't seem to like really line up with the data all the time or explain it gives us like a different thing to investigate and then we can go back to our more empirical tool and say okay well now that we've got these stories well let's investigate this thing and now we've got like a much cleaner line we can draw because we did like a qualitative analysis of the individual first i don't quite understand that because all the things you listed are all empirical data like metadata and confounding variables those don't come from stories those come from data so all of those things that you mentioned that were used to correct the data and find out it really wasn't the sleep it was all these other variables that's all classic psychology data empirical science stuff. None of that was the storytelling. We didn't get any of that from the storytelling. So the, I think the problem is there's, I think there's a, if I say the statement, you agree or disagree with this, there's a lot of normativity that precedes choosing data points. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Uh, or do you want me to explain a little more what I mean by it? So, um, sort of. So I think that there is definitely biases that are in like scientific ways of assessing data, but mm -hmm. I think that a lot of that a lot of science goes into trying to filter that out to the greatest extent. And For so, sure. And uh, I agree with that, but I think there are still times when sometimes people can miss stories um, or miss like why people feel a certain way about something or miss how like um, different things can happen. So that's like in a, in a perfect world where we can just where we could crunch every single number and put it all in. I don't think an individual story ever matters. I, I think I would agree with that. If we could measure everything perfectly. But it seems like sometimes starting from a different point of investigation or different using a different tool to investigate, that we can take that back and say, OK, well, actually, let's look at this data point instead because we've talked to these people. Um, and I think even in even more rigorous sciences, like there, there is value to this. Like You might have one person and their entire life, they'll spend 20 years with like one tribe. Or, or somebody will spend 15 years researching just one political leader. Um, and then their life and how their life intersect with their political views. And I think sometimes there's a value in that, in that individual story there. Um, and then we can use that to either interpret data a different way or look for different types of data. Even if maybe if we would have been smarter beforehand, we could have avoided that whole story altogether, potentially. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, that we could use stories as a basis to construct a new hypothesis. But I don't think we could ever use the stories as hard evidence for the hypothesis. I would, pr I probably agree with that. That's why I, I prefaced all of this with saying, like, I think CRT is a good tool. But I think we have to be really careful not to say that it's the be-all and end-all. Much the same way that like somebody that only wants to throw graphs at you, it's like, well, hold on, like, um, you know, like the average the average person does not have 1.8 arms and 1.7 children, right? That we have to get a little bit more granular sometimes with our analysis. So yeah, I mean, like I agree, like you, you, you that shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. Um, it should be part of like a basket of tools that we use to analyze society. Yeah. Any last questions on that? Otherwise, we can go into those kind of exploratory question. Amy, did you have one? I, I am kind of s split on the notion because I do believe that there is still discrimination. If you actually read what they're trying to say, they say, well, the, the examples they will often give is a, a, a white woman is dealing with this issue, a black man is dealing with this issue, and then when you actually look at, at the finer lens, black women are dealing with both of those struggles and increased rate. I, I think that that is useful. I think that that, like Destiny was saying, I think that could be part of a solution for how we end 
racism, but I think that overall, I will reiterate, I am critical of the theory of race. And so I do think, while acknowledging that there is still racism, discrimination, and terrible things, and while using those tools, we should be moving toward a raceless society, which I do think that we will get one day, uh, not from utopia, not from legislation, or you know, the Frankfurt School, which they're very, all these types of buzzwords, it'll happen through sex. You got it. I, I don't think that it's gonna solve the hatred, though. People are always gonna hate one another, and so that's, n that's not the solution. <laughs> but anyway. Were there any other questions that you guys had for each other based on past talks that you might want to ask each other? Otherwise, we can jump into the Q&A. We're close to that time. Oh, yeah. Um, what could possibly be a better standard than human well-being and happiness? Um, you said that, that that shouldn't be the way doctors assess what's healthy. What, what could possibly be a better way than that? <sighs> I guess I don't know. Well, if you don't know, then why would you say it's wrong for doctors to prescribe I'll things say, based off of that? I'll say, I don't know that, I'm, that that's right. Because I, I can't. What's right? It, it, the, 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 the medical things that support someone turning in, turning, transitioning and stuff like that. Well, do, do you think that scientists, forgetting the trans issue, do you think that scientists in general, in psychology, do make decisions based off of some metric to measure happiness of people. Like there's money, they measure how much money it takes for people to make be happy and more money up to about $50,000 a year makes people more happy and then going above that it's a diminished amount. Like do you think that's legitimate science? It's it's a it's an interesting legitimate this is psychology, is that what you're saying that that is? And and statistics of it? Psychology, sociology. Yeah. I I think that it is a loosey goosey thing because people's sense of well-being can be misguided. You know, people get, people get reinf re reinforcement, positive reinforcement from things that uh, aren't good for them or aren't right. And although you, you, can go, you can take a whole mission in life and have everybody around you supporting you and distract yourself from those quiet moments when you realize that you're wrong, so that you have this sense of well-being, but in reality, it's going to crumble at some point, or it's just you're doing evil in the world. You know? Well, sure. So I'd agree there's a gray area where the, like, there's p-values that say plus or minus or whatever, but do you think that in general, they get it probably right? So they say that if you're lower than $50,000 a year in America, because it's an American statistic, that you're less happy, and then once you get to that amount, because you have like food and homes and all these things, mm -hmm. you're generally happy, and then once you get more money than that, you, you can get slightly happier, but it's not, it's diminished. Like, do you think that's an accurate statistic that does, even though there's a gray area? It, it, it probably is, but I am strong on the gray area thing, kind of like what Destiny was brought, I mean, that Stephen was bringing up, was that um, there's other factors, like they are always. working for yourself is like a gratifying. Well, there's always other factors, but you agree that this isn't just, this can't be like completely wrong. It's accurate right. to some extent. Yes. And if they use the same metrics to measure happiness of trans people, for mm -hmm. example, aren't the scientists to the same extent, whatever extent this is correct, the scientists and the doctors would be equally as justified in using these statistics on trans people since it's the exact same data they use on all the other measurements of happiness to whatever degree that is trustworthy. <laughs> um, I, I suppose that I suppose that it does really make them feel better for a time, maybe even for a long time. Well, my is question it, about is, it, are the doctors justified in saying, by this data, which works for the money index, that they it make people are happier with this amount of money and this data is correct and we trust this data, are they also justified in trusting the data about trans people that giving them transitions make them happier because they're using the same kind of data? I think I would become a, a critical religious theorist at that point and use anecdotes because <laughs> the exceptions there are very few people who really find their way in life, you know, and so, <laughs> you're laughing <laughs> or you're like, because there are a few people who really find true peace. 
so this, the, all, all these ways that we find a sense of well-being aren't necessarily right. So is, I, is there still, a scientific, I would still reject. Is there a scientific way to measure this true peace thing, or is this kind of just your feeling? Because I, I, all I know is the best scientific data we have is uh -huh. here's how we measure happiness using all the, the money index, the psychology if can, index. If you can find the three people in the world who have true, true peace, then you, I suppose you can make it scientifically sound. But if but we don't have that happen. yet, shouldn't we go with the thing we have the most evidence for, which is the current happiness index? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I still reject it because I'm suspicious of it. I mean, just look, look on the face of it. Does it seem right to you? Well, well so, to, so yeah, to me it does, but it suppose, seems, it suppose seems right to you to support the, the transgenders turning, transitioning. Yes, because the vast majority of people who do transition are happy with the transition and don't regret it. But how about your sense without knowing the data and all that stuff? I, I go, I'm, I'm a data person. I'm like, science says this, science is right, my feelings are stupid. Okay. And it does bring up, I, common sense to me is kind of arbitrary. Like, what is common sense to someone could be completely oblivious to another. Right. And so if, Multiple people are coming to different conclusions using common sense. Doesn't that kind of mean that it's really not a great way to? Well, people, yeah, there, I mean, there is an attack on, common sense has been kind of lost amongst us because especially in a spoiled society where we can all do kind of what we want and not really suffer the consequences of it, then yeah, you, people lose their common sense. In a lay, I can understand the term in a lay sense, like, oh, come on, where's your common sense? You forgot your keys? But like, I, once we're dealing with like, who we are as human beings fundamentally, I, I, it goes much more to, I would say, the data. <clears throat> that would I say that good sense comes from, from God, and we, we don't really have, and we don't really have sense. If you look at how most of us live, we're not sensible. Can you give an example? I don't, uh, I mean, the, uh, look at our issues. We do stuff that is counter to our health frequently and just can't get, can't get away from it. See, I would agree with you, but I think, uh, using your metric was God, I feel like sometimes that metric gets us to the anti-science position. Not always, not right. always, because I actually do want to paint with as thin a brush as possible. <laughs> there are many amazing, fantastic, theistic, scientific skeptics out there. But I do find that when you're using God as your, your primary metric for not just yourself, because we are, right. we're dealing with Politics and, and dealing with everybody. everyone. And so, to put this in a question form, what would it take to convince you that transitioning actually is the proper, with the therapists that have found the, the answer, what would it take to convince you that transitioning is the correct solution? I don't think I could be convinced because it just, I just it inherently kind of know there's something off with it. You know what I mean? And uh, so too, the, this reliance on science and data stuff, we don't know what all to look for, like what Destiny, uh, J Stephen was just talking about. They were, looking at, they were looking at sleep. In reality, there was a whole lot of other things going on. And people have an agenda when they come up with statistics and things like that. Let me just break apart that. I feel like statistics can be manipulated in, in, in certain ways because you, you're looking for things. Nonetheless, I'd break apart your first sentence because I really do think that the best methodology for finding truth is science. And so I can't help but put that as the primary guidance. And then once again, it goes back to, it's not just like, uh, data can be very cold, but a lot of these data points are from real people who have transitioned and found better lives. Um, are you an atheist? I am. I'm an agnostic atheist. I, I break those apart. See? See what? <laughs> because you don't even believe in God, so you don't 
health. Anyway. I, I agree. No, I agree. That's our difference. I think we're using different metrics. Though yeah. I think that many theists actually, uh, they, they maybe even put them on co-side. Maybe there's God and science and they're, they're, they're working together. But it does seem like you are putting God above the science. And then, yes, as, as many. But, uh, all, but it's not just a God thing because just like I said, at the common sense level, sure. like it's when you whether today or before you transitioned or whatever, mm -hmm. did you have any sense that something was off about what you were about to do or what you were, were There wanting? was fear, but many of the fears were unfounded. I thought that my pair, I, I knew that my parents were gonna throw me out and yet they didn't. Uh, I they knew were. that I was gonna lose all my friends, but I didn't. I knew that my, uh, life was going to end, and it didn't. See, that proves that your mind lies to you. Uh, I see you're saying it's lying. I think it's a vulnerable teenager in depression. Right. I think that that's not lying to you. I think that you run through the most ho horrible situation. In fact, I'll relate this to you uh, as a, a parent or to anyone. When you uh, haven't received a call from your child in a, a, a few hours or a day they were supposed to, your mind just runs through yep. the worst scenarios possible. Almost never true. Yep. Nonetheless, you can't help for your brain to run through the terrible scenarios. But that's why you know to withhold rather than make a, deci make a decision or, a, or come to a conclusion. But see, if I withheld, I would be Staying, if I was even alive, I, I, in my opinion, I'd be miserable. I would be trying to live my life for other people. And it's great to live your life in defense and to fight for other people, but to just live day to day so that you're just moving through the motions, that's not life. But you, but you are surmising that since you didn't do that, you don't know what you would be going through. Well, that's true. I yeah. cannot predict the future. I can only tell you from that event, and I can also tell you that it was one of the best decisions in my life. All right. <laughs> well, a question. I wish you well. I got a, two yeah, more I wish questions. You well too. Thank you. Uh, hey, you said you brought it up as a joke that you would go to critical religion theory. Uh, well, I'm half joking. There's definitely truth to it. Well, yeah, that's, that's my question is that yeah. it seems, what is the difference between what you're doing and using your intuition in order to make a judgment than what critical race theory is doing and them using their intuition storytelling? Because it seems like the same problems with critical race theory exist in your critical religion theory. Well, definitely um, people who are religious and Christian, many, if probably most, are wrong and mistaken in our judgments that we make because we, we're not God, and so we don't really know right from wrong. I think nobody really knows right from wrong. Well, my question was, how is your methodology different yeah. from the critical race theory methodology? Um, it's, uh, it's different in that I am seeking for truth and withholding Whereas those people are... Well, did you think they're seeking falsehood? They're like, we wanna, we wanna find what's false. Well, I mean, that woman who, well, okay. I was gonna say the 1619 Project, but that's not critical race theory. Um, but those people are just dumb liberals. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the, that's the nice. difference. That is the <laughs> yeah. fundamental, fundamental difference. All right, uh, second question. Destiny, from our, you mentioned that CRT is a valid way to assess a new hypothesis. To bring up our previous debate, isn't, how is that different from me using moral realism as a different way to come up with a different hypothesis? Um, I think that there is a, uh, I guess it would depend, I, I don't know hardcore on the epistemic philosophy of a, a CRT person. Um, if a CRT person is saying that an individual story is conveying some fundamental truth about reality, um, I would hope they wouldn't say that, but I would fight on that point. Um, as opposed to if a CRT person says that a story is conveying a fundamental truth relative to that person or that person's story, then I think that's, I think that's okay. So an individual can have a story, and that story can be true for that individual, 
but that might not necessarily map on to some things in the world in the way that they might think it does. Um, so, for example, maybe. Just to clarify, isn't, oh, yeah, that, isn't that exactly what they're doing? They're saying that this story told by this person is a more correspondence to reality than the data or uh, the scientific research, and we can reject the scientific research because this story overrides that. Isn't that exactly if, what they're if doing? That, if, if a proponent of CRT says that we ought to reject I empirical data in favor of stories, that's not good. I, I wouldn't agree with that. But I do think that stories are essential sometimes because the data won't capture all of it. I don't remember if I gave this or something else an example, but like um, I, I didn't specifically take this, but like the inflation and how the economy is doing is a really good example. Because sometimes you can look at every data point and still not understand how a person feels about the economy because their experience of the economy might actually fall completely outside of the data. Um, so for instance, if you were trying to capture an infinite number of metrics for how a person feels about the economy, you might miss it because how they feel about the economy is actually informed by what Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh or um, Cooper, Anderson Cooper, whatever, or somebody on the left or right tells them, in which case all the data in the world isn't going to give you that person's story. Now that person's story, they might say, well actually, the economy is doing really well and I feel very strongly about that. Now what I would hope a CRT person is like, well that person's story is true insofar as they're accurately conveying their experience, but it might not map onto reality in such a way that, well this guy says the economy is good, well then screw the data, we don't need the data, we're just going to go by that person's story. Um, I would imagine there's probably some debate within the CRT community or people in terms of like where do stories fit in in terms of with like quantitative data but I can't I can't pretend to tell you what every big CRT scholar or thinker believes in terms of that. All right, with that we can jump in a Q&A. So, anybody who has a question, please feel free to come on al along this right side of the aisle and then on the other side of the aisle you'll be able to walk back that way you don't have to go over the cords. Hi, it's me again. Hey, <laughs> of course. Hey. I have another question for you. So, obviously, you seem very strong about transgenderism and whatnot. And she brought her story, and she seems very happy. You even brought up an article saying that kids are happier when they earlier transition. So, and there's also, you're saying that you're using religion in order to say that people shouldn't transition, but there is nothing in the Bible that says anything about it. So, I'm asking you, what would change your mind? Because like, there's got to be something in order to be able to change your mind about the transgenderism. So what is it? You think that there's some, I don't know if there is anything that would change my mind. Like, if it said it in the so, Bible. <laughs> like, I don't have even, a Sharpie? <laughs> you're right, I don't even really base it in so much religion as like common sense, which I feel is God given but, to us. So there is no facts that would change your feelings yeah. about, <clears throat> so but it's, feelings but what's, over facts. But what's funny is like, you guys are putting feelings over facts too. No, no, no. you just Be said that there's no facts that would change your feelings about transgenderism. So but I, I don't have feelings about facts. trans, I have, I have a, a sense, I guess you could call that a feeling, that's true. I have a sense about that it's wrong, but I don't have like a strong feeling f for or against them personally. So I'm not, I'm not basing it on like an, an emotion, I don't think. I, th I it's think, like a in so far as the question goes, what I would hope is that any pro-trans person, if we had perfect information of the brain and we cut into it and we realized actually there is no part of the brain that maps onto transgenderism, it's all a socially influenced thing, I think most people on the left would say, oh, okay, well we should try to eliminate those social influences so that we don't have trans people that have a whole bunch of problems in life. They could, I would hope they would say, I know I would say, okay, I've been convinced, it's not, trans whatever has, is not a biological phenomenon, it's more of a bio, biology intersecting with um, environment phenomenon. So I, I would make that concession, but it sounds like for you, let's say we could cut into a part of the brain, mm -hmm. and let's say we actually see that like, some people's brains have the fucking letter T branded in on them, uh -huh. and it's a this is a trans brain, we know it, and everybody can identify it. You still wouldn't believe that that's a real thing, though. I don't think that I would, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but didn't she, can you restate the, just in brief what your question just was? Because like you said something. Oh. Just my question. Okay. I, I think I'll repeat what I said in the prior debate where it's, if, it seems like you guys are seeing something wrong with me for seeing something wrong with what's going on in the world when I'm not the one who's wrong. So, so if, G, if Jesus himself came down and told you trans people are real, you're wrong, would you believe Jesus? I don't know if I would. <laughs> I would be like, I've been on drugs or something. Yeah, well, that answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How you guys doing? Doing well, you doing? thank you. Can you jump? Everybody, can you hear me? It's good. There you go, even closer, just make sure. What about now, y'all? Talk louder. <laughs> uh, well, okay, now, I'm gonna talk about CRT. Um, CRT is not being taught. 
K through five, K five through twelve. It's not being taught at all. Uh, it is a college elective um, that in graduate school, um, it, which uh, actually uh, Dr. Ritchie, uh, he's in, in dispute. He teaches as an elective course for the past what five years. Um, CRT in itself, uh, like you said, you haven't even heard it for the past year, but it was highlighted in like 2017 when Trump highlighted it. And once he highlighted it, the media in of itself, they grabbed onto it and called it a very decisive thing. And, um, and, uh, and it's the same as, as woke, uh, you know, I mean, the word woke essentially has been deemed as a, as a, as a highly de divisive thing in, in our community when woke been around since the 60s. I mean, stay woke, brother. You, you heard of that before, right? And because of this fear of CRT, uh, here in Texas, they created a SB3, a Senate Bill 3. And, and what that does is um, it basically takes away the, um, you can't teach the history of Native Americans um, in school. You can't, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 and uh, 1850. Uh, writings of Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, the 1619 Project, which is you know examines the history of, um, of the slavery uh, on American soil, which actually black slavery were here way before 1619. Um, uh, the Women's uh, Suffrage uh, Act, and most importantly, what uh, SB3 in Texas, uh, they basically uh, takes takes away the history of white supremacy, uh, including but not including uh, slavery and the eugenics movement. Um, basically, they're saying. If you the, the the subject of Ku Klux Klan come up in the state of Texas, Sister, I, to, yes, I, I, got, I got you. I got you. Um, it's, it's not considered morally wrong. Now, uh, a lot of states now are now um, allowing Bible study to be taught in schools um, in, as an elective for children, which is indoctrinated into uh, religion. If CRT cannot be taught in school. How is it right for religion to be taught in school when, I mean, religion get leaned on every day by science? It's completely infactual, but we're talking about facts as far as black people. Yeah, how can, yeah, I got you. How can, I got you, my friend. Um, is it right for Bible study to be taught in school versus CRT? Um, I do know that the, like for example, the people's history of the United States, I forget what the name of that guy who came up with that thing was, but I've heard more and more this notion of racism being taught in school. So regardless of whether it was CRT specifically, I don't like this push that this racism thing is real and we need to be addressing it. Um, the stay woke thing, I, I started seeing that with um, DeRay McKesson. Like he had that little weak fist and said stay woke. Um, Politicians, I don't, you're right, I don't trust the Republicans necessarily to, maybe they overcompensate or whatever, but I don't think that a normal person would be against the right and wrong of what whites have done over history be taught. But sometimes they call stuff wrong that wasn't necessarily wrong. You know, like there's a lot of lies and propaganda. So, and the, and the, tr and the Bible, I don't think the Bible has been debunked by science or anything, but, um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. I actually think this is a really good point. I wanted to bring it up that, yes, I think the reason CRT was criticized as being taught in K through 12 was because the teachers who had independently researched CRT had then found those things inspirational and then were teaching the consequences of CRT to kids, namely about this stuff about American history. And then the news picked up on this and said they were teaching kids in preschool CRT, which wasn't exactly the case. They weren't actually teaching college level CRT to the preschoolers. Um, but I think you're exactly right that it is exactly like teaching evolution in school and that they're taking their own biases and then imprinting them on children, which they shouldn't be doing unless there is some kind of approval by the state to do this. But you're right, it's just as bad to try to indoctrinate kids towards a left ideology as is to try to indoctrinate them with evolution denial or young earth creationism in the right ideology. One thing about the 1619 project I heard was that they, they claimed that the real founding was 1619 rather than 1776. So I don't, that seems a little off to me. Just because we have a lot of yeah. Thank you. Hey, nice to see you up there, Amy. Um, quick question for all four of y'all, just a quick, uh, I need to just get a clarification, something you said in the last debate, and I just want to, uh, if y'all can answer it as well. I just really need to know what you mean when you say, uh, well, is racism real, is transphobia and racism real? And the same question goes for y'all as well. I say no. Um, there is wrong done to 
like there's wrong done to whites, there's wrong done to blacks, and they say, oh, it's, it's racism. But it's not at heart racism. It's because of some other issue that's going on. And then you said about transphobia. Is trans Do you think that's really cool? I don't think so either. I think that there are people who are just evil to one another, and then sometimes people just have a difference of opinion, and then they're called transphobic. So just because race is not a real concept, at least biologically, does not mean that racism does not still exist. I would say that it depends on all different uh, countries, uh, all different areas where you're going to be. I think in the United States we still deal with some of the remnants. I'm not going to put a bias on either direction. I, if you doesn't matter if you consider yourself black, if you consider yourself white, we should be coming together to figure out how to make a better, more functional society. And if we could drop off a lot of the remnants of tribalism, of a lot of our um, hair splitting over uh, what color eyes someone has, what skin they have, just very arbitrary things that I think if uh, the clock would, would uh, go back, we may pick different lines. It may not be black versus white, it might be blue eye versus brown eye, or blue eye versus green eye. And so we should be moving towards a more raceless society. Uh, yes, race is definitely real. We know this empirically because of in-group, out-group biases that have been proven to happen biologically. It's like saying that there's no such thing as a sports rivalry. Sports rivalries aren't real. Yes, they are. We're in Texas. Of course they are. Um, so yes, we know for a fact that race is real. We know for a fact that there is an in-group, out-group bias, that humans innately find differences between groups and then classify some as better and some as worse. And we can classify those differences under specific banners of where they happen most, like race, like religion. So yes, definitely race and transphobia is real. Yeah, I mean, I would say racism and transphobia is real. Uh, maybe some people exaggerate it, maybe some people underplay, but I mean, I'd say they're both real, yeah. Okay, so my question is more so with uh, trans people in sports. And I mean, I think it's probably gonna be more so towards Destiny and maybe J, J Jump or T Jump, T -jump sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, but okay, so basically, um, so as we can see, um, trans women are starting to like outperform a lot of uh, like actual women in, Olymp in the Olympics, like, well, in like some sports, and we can see that trans men are being, uh, they're underperforming in uh, sports that men usually, usually are in, right? So should there be, should, trans people will be able to tr like participate in the same sports as uh, actual men and women, or should there just be, uh, like, should they just be like a whole division just for themselves, right? Like, should they just be on their own league, right? So kind of like, instead of like an NWBA, there should be an NTBA or something like that, right? Um, what do you think about that? Um, I think if there was a sufficient number of them where they could actually have their own league, that would be a great idea. But I think that you're right that there is a spectrum of trans people and those who have not gone through hormone therapy do have a physical advantage. And the hormone therapy can, it affects people differently and so some people even after they've gone through it, they still have a physical advantage. So there is a difference uh, between trans people and uh, the other sex that they're transitioning into. But I think that it should be up to the sports organizations to determine when someone does qualify as having gone through the transition and is physically equal. Because the people you mentioned who are trans but are winning all those sports aren't all the trans people who are competing. There are trans people who go into the sports and do about average or do lower than average. And so there's a spectrum just like there is with any group. And we should let essentially the organizations and the people who are experts in the field determine when someone who has gone through enough trans hormonal therapy and if they've been affected enough to legitimately qualify as being as a part of that sport? Um, I think that the trans people in sports, I think, uh, kind of blows apart a lot of how we analyze fairness in sports. I think um, it's really, really, really hard to say that somebody that can train in one body and then compete in another is ever going to be fair for the people that they're transitioning to compete with. 
Um, so for instance, it's sad because we always talk about trans women, but nobody ever addresses trans men. Um, it seems like trans women can be very competitive against other cis women, and we've seen this happen time and time again, but I don't really know of any examples of trans men showing up and being very competitive with cis men. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that like if you were allowed to say, we'll use performance enhancing drugs or steroids and train for some number of years and then stop, you're still going to inherit many of the advantages of being able to train in that environment before going into a competitive environment. Um, much the same that if you are in a, a man's body and you're allowed to train for a certain amount of time and then you transition and as a trans woman you compete against cis women, there's still going to be a lot of one inherited training time in, an, in another type of body that you've got an advantage of. And and then two, there's a lot of like physiological differences where on the spectrum of all man traits, even though there's an overlap with women, um, the average male traits are quite a bit higher. So like uh, greater lung capacity, broader bone structure. Um, these are things that don't go away with any amount of hormone therapy. You can diminish some of the testosterone and some of the effects on the human physiology, but you're not going to get rid of a lot of those structures that are rigidly in place and set uh, during and post puberty. And this is well known in the trans community as well, and it's one of the reasons why they push some much for puberty blockers is because if you are going through puberty as a certain sex, when, once you're done with that process, it's really hard to undo, a trans person's way to undo that damage um, because there's so much that's set in that you can't really just shrug off or get rid of with hormone therapy. It starts to get more expensive or costly past that point. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. My question, question was that, that should they be in their own league? Should they? <laughs> I, I think, I think do, you kind of have to, but once you put them in their own league, it's going to be such a niche event that it almost feels like you're saying they can't compete at all. So, I, it's a, I, but, it, but the problem is, is that like we have to look at different worlds. If we lived in a world where the top 10 um, female competitors were trans women, th no, one's, no one wins there. Right? Everybody is going to be pissed off. There's going to be probably more hatred towards trans people. So women are going to feel like, well, what the fuck? There's no point in me doing a sport anymore. Like that, that would be like the worst possible world, I think, to be in. Probably worse than the one where we segregate sports based on um, trans or intersex or cisgender people, I would say. So it seems like it probably needs to be its own thing. Or at the very least, we draw the distinction like pre- or post-puberty transition, I think. I think I'm more more authoritarian than I let on then. Because oh, no, I, we all know you're very authoritarian, because, um, don't worry. Because um, I don't think that they should be allowed in the sports because it's, it's promoting visibility, right? Vi yeah, visibility, it plants something in, the, in young people's minds, say, that, hey, this is a possibility, and then Satan can whisper in their ear, you, you are this, and you want to be like this. So I don't, it's part of that promoting wrong is right type of, should, wrong is, not necessarily right, but wrong is fine. Should atheists be allowed in sports? <laughs> as long as they keep their mouth shut. <laughs> I was playing around. Anna, but, yeah. oh, no. I just want to say that I think sports of all of the trans rights issues is probably the most complicated because we are dealing with different type of activities that stress the body, we are pushing it to the limitations, and a lot of times when we are dealing with things like the Olympics, we are dealing with the extreme. So it is actually the one chance that we should pay attention to it. I'm actually open to multiple ideas. The joke I've always gone by is that if you make a trans league, I think we will absolutely be like the number one on cable. Like everyone will watch that, whether you like sports or not. So I'm actually open to that idea. Uh, but you know, the, the metric here is fairness. We want to be fair. I do not want to, pun intended, transition biological women out of sports. And so we need to figure out a way in which we could have them compete and transgender women aren't dominating. I agree with Destiny when he said if it was the top 10, I think it is over-exaggerated how much they are dominating in sports. Nonetheless, I do think that there are advantages that you gain during, depending on when you start transitioning. That is why, like they were saying, you, you want to transition as early as possible when you know it when you actually know it and at puberty that it let's let's not try and push that but it can't just be that anyone just says well i transition I, i'm just this other gender today so you put me on that team we do need to make sure 
that these are actual transgender people. We need to look at the actual sport because there are some sports in which there are major advantages and there are some sports in which there are no sexual dimorphic one way or the other. And so it is, in my opinion, the most complicated of all of the trans issues, I think like the, the bathroom stuff and that is nonsense. But when it actually comes to sports, it's not clear cut. We're going to have to dig down. We're going to have to work to be fair. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, this, this is a question, question for Stephen. Um, Stephen, you said that CRT is a red herring for people on the right to group together. Uh, similar to Bill C-16 in Canada, which was blown out of proportion all the way up to the popularity of Jordan Peterson. Uh, in terms of overhyping certain topics to rally groups of people together, how big of a problem is it? And do you think that engaging in that discourse to a certain extent kind of further stokes that, that fake flame? flame? I think it's a big problem, but I think that people on the left watch those conversations hardcore too. Um, I think you need to be very clear about disavowing stupid shit and then very clear on engaging with people that have other types of ideas um, or, or misconceptions about what you maybe believe in. So for instance, like, I think that there is value in different ways of looking through society, but there was undeniably some garbage textbooks that were written that seemed to have maybe a few too many CRT ideas in mind. Um, I don't know if you've watched my stuff or not, but like I remember we read through one of these math books on stream that basically said that like black kids are like too stupid to learn math with numbers, so they need to run around in groups in order to. It was like a really out there way of like explain. And I'm not even exaggerating. You can find this math book. It's like unbelievable how they say like well black brains are wired to learn differently than white brains, or there are some. Um, oh man, what there, there is a. I don't know if this is a meme or if this is posted um, in the. NAACP museum or something or whatever, but it's this idea that like maintaining a schedule or whatever is a white person's concept and like black people can't do that. Um, I think you have to be quick on the left. You're like, okay, hold on. There's actual some garbage here that it's fair to say this is like dumb. This is stupid. Uh, but it's, it feels like people on the left sometimes get so caught up in, in, in hearing something that somebody on the right says and then feeling like they have to defend the opposite of every single thing that you'll get people saying, you know, shit like January 6th is literally Hiroshima, but you know, Seattle and Minnesota and all these other, or, or um, Minneapolis or all these other cities, like, you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, it's like, well, hold on. You, you have to be able to say that, like, rioting is bad and January 6th is bad. Or you have to be able to say that, like, yeah, you know, some of these ideas are dumb, but we're going to defend these ideas. Like, people have a really hard time picking and choosing what to defend. They just, it all ends up being like this big political uh, uh, team sport, basically. So, given the state of the left, like, do you think that um, they should probably just, if you see something where it's like a big thing that's getting blown out of proportion, should your advice to the people on the left should just like let the flame die out or should they try to? I think that you own one thing and then you quickly move the topic on. So like if a Republican wanted to debate me on like mainstream TV and he's like, we shouldn't teach our kids CRT. Like my response is, yeah, I agree. We probably shouldn't teach kids CRT. What like in specific do you think we shouldn't teach them? And then you move on to that part of the conversation because we don't teach them CRT. And if you're saying that there's some like, downstream topic that we teach them. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Should we not teach kids about slavery? Should we not teach kids about this? Like, what do you want to talk about instead, rather than getting hung up on defending the esoteric ideas of whatever weird shit you're being accused of? So you also think that... Oh, yes, Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yeah. Hello, y'all. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is primarily directed towards T-Jump, but I guess if anyone wants to jump in as well, feel free. Um, so... You mentioned how you have an issue with CRT because it primarily relies on counter storytelling, which is fallacious. However, uh, despite the fact that like over the centuries, historians have like accumulated a ton of different data points when it comes to like, I don't know, population, uh, like the general state of the economy at the time, et cetera, et cetera. The history that we learn in K through 12, as well as in upper education is primarily done through storytelling. For example, uh, usually in history, you will learn that like the War of Roses or the Hundred Year War, sorry, uh, between England and France is the primary thing that led towards their animosity for the next couple centuries or how the American Revolution finishing uh, was the main is one of the main drivers that led to the French Revolution happening. Uh, since history seems to engage in so much storytelling, uh, do you think that it is equally fallacious and shouldn't be taught in uh, K through 12 courses or upper education, or do you find some sort of distinction between the storytelling in one or the other? 
Yeah, so it wasn't the storytelling, it was the standpoint epistemology. Standpoint epistemology is fundamentally an anecdotal fallacy. And then standpoint epistemology is when you use the stories to counter or to oppose the data. If you're just using the stories as a basis to form a hypothesis, perfectly fine. But it can't be used as evidence to confirm the hypothesis. You need independent data for that. So my, the, my criticism of, of CRT isn't that storytelling itself is bad. It's when you use the storytelling to contradict the data or to use it as a confirmation of a hypothesis without data. The data itself always supersedes the storytelling, and the fallacious part is when you revert that and use the storytelling to contradict the data. Is it okay if I answer Eric's follow up to that? If you get in line. Uh, sorry, so we, we yeah, well, well, get, 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 it, get in line. Oh, If you can, just as close as you can to the mic, because it's... Hello. Um, my, I have two questions that are very short. Um, I didn't catch your name. I'm Amy Newman. Nice to meet you. Amy Newman. Hi. Hi. Um, would you accept racism as a term, uh, or race as a term, to as shorthand to mean a combination of nationality and, and phenotype? I'll be honest with you. Race to me is a complicated term because I am the one, no, I'm not the one person, but I view it as a catch-all. So some people mean different things for it. So some people are just talking about their ethnicity. They're saying, I came from a certain place and this was my race. Some people uh, try to attach it more to just what you're looking like in front of you. If you are, have light skin, then you are white. If you have dark skin, then you are black. And yet, it gets much muddier than that. And I'll give you the example. It's the main driver for why is that I come from uh, a Jewish background. I'm no longer. And I have found that people will look at me dead in the face, and they will look at my skin color and they'll be like, you ain't white. I'm not considering you white at all. And I think normal people, I think, almost getting into norm normativity, I think <laughs> many people, lay people, would find that strange. Because it gets into the territory of, well, what do you mean skin type, skin color has nothing to do with race? Because I think most people, that would be their leading identifier. And so I am almost in a position that depending on your political ideology, that is what my race tends to lean towards, that I become almost more of a minority, depending on certain circles, and I become more of the majority in certain circles. And so I do not think that there is good empirical grounds for it, and I think that it is a mix of those terms. You really need to ask almost every person what they mean. I think that you can find social niches but I don't think that you can find an empirical basis for the actual concept. I think we would be better off if you have an ethnicity, be proud of your ethnicity. I'm not telling you to hate who you are, who you come from. In fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. Be, be proud and happy of the accomplishments and the fact that we stand on the shoulders of giants from our ancestors. That being said, I think that we should try to move away from that term. I think it's divisive. I don't think that it really adds anything. And I think that the further we go on I into this uh, scientific-based society, we're going to move away from those concepts naturally. And my another quick one is for a yes, just CRT. To, just to give a, I was, I was ready, you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, with CRT, um, my problem with it is not that it's about storytelling, it's about that the, the supposition is put before the research. So the idea that racism affects outcomes is put first before they go out and look for examples. 
And so in my mind, regardless of whether or not it's empirical or storytelling, the fact that they put the cart before the horse, in my mind, should disqualify it immediately. Yeah, I don't think that's unique to CRT or even necessarily a part of CRT. I think there, there is an issue, broadly speaking, um, where when people are looking at data, they'll start with a bad assumption. They'll start with bad priors that maybe need to be changed. So if somebody sees a difference between male and female achievement in something, they'll, the default is their sexism, and we need to try to find the sexism. Or if there's a difference between races and some outcome, oh, it must be this or that. Um, and I agree that that can be a fallacious way of thinking. I don't think that's unique to CRT. I think a lot of people can make errors like that. In a a lot of different parts of their lives though um, or whether we're talking scientifically or individually but I bet I mean for people that would do that like presupposing that some gap must be explained by some variable would be a flaw in your thinking I think you're gonna miss potentially other problems by doing that I would agree with that without, without being too heavy, heavy I would without, without being too heavy, heavy I think that's what all the CRT pretty much is is, is that, that supposition I get really hard, um, no, I don't get hard. Um, <laughs> I have a really hard time trying to say that like everybody in some academic discipline is committed to something because it always seems like when you tear into a lot of academic disciplines, there's always like a ton of debate inside um, between how people are utilizing some tool and there's like the scholars will debate. Um, like the most common example is like Jordan Peterson is very critical of postmodernism and he'll say like postmodernism, like it's one coherent school of thought, but like half the people that are considered postmodernists don't even like to be considered postmodern. So it's, like, it's always like a really difficult thing to say, like everybody in this academic discipline believes this thing. There's probably debate inside. And I, I can always argue the ideas, but um, I, get, I, I have a hard time committing an entire class of people to like one particular thought or not. First of all, let me apologize to everybody for being rude. I got too excited and I hadn't asked my question, so I apologize to you. Uh, that was rude to me. So this is a follow-up question to the question that was before this gentleman was just before me. Uh, you said that you don't like the fact that um, data is being used in substitution, or not data, I'm sorry, that stories are being used in substitution of data. But data as a scientific discipline is actually fairly new. And we, like we'll say 1970s or so is when we actually got to a point where we could collect it in a scientific manner in a way that we know that it could be validated well. So what would you say to people that are like, hey, the data before 1970s, we can't really uh, look to, and we have to use these stories in a way to either one, create the data either from a historical perspective or know where to go look for that data. And how would you respond to something like that? Um, well, data isn't new. Like this comes from the early philosophies of Plato and the empiricists versus the rationalists uh, thousands of years ago. So, so when, I, when I use the term data, I'm comparing it to anecdotes, the anecdotal fallacy which originates in the philosophy of ancient Greece and their comparison to actual hard empirical data. So if you prioritize the anecdote over the data, it's an anecdotal fallacy. And so my comparison here isn't to modern scientific things in just the definition of data. We've known what an anecdotal fallacy is for thousands of years. And modern data is the best stuff we have. And we know that if you are using anecdotes to overrun modern data, that's even worse than using it to overrun past empirical data from the Greeks. So if you try to use storytelling and anecdotes to override modern scientific data, it's complete crap. But you would, but would you say that you have to start somewhere? And, and these stories can be a, a starting, starting position. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you, you can use anything you want to build a hypothesis. Build, you can build, you just shake a magic eight ball and build a hypothesis. But you can never use the hypothesis or the premise of the hypothesis as evidence of its truth. You need the data. The data always supersedes the hypothesis. All right, thank you very much, folks. We'll have our last panel for the day at 5 p.m. Looking forward to it. And thanks to our speakers. Fantastic. Really do appreciate you guys.